uh, today, really, there's two major platforms that are available for you. One is PC. It runs on an operating system called Microsoft Windows, and that's the most popular one. So nine times out of ten, somebody's using Windows. Uh, it's very popular, and it works with almost anything. So it's a great platform. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> no, people don't like it. <laughs> the other platform uh, is Mac OS. It's made by a company called Apple. Uh, they're the guys that make the iPod, and you may have heard the iPhone. Uh, and they're pretty popular lately. Here on uh, Cal, I think they're a little more popular than uh, they are overall. But they're very good computers. Uh, they're very secure. It's what we're going to be using today. And most of what we show you today is going to be on the Mac. new computer these, computers these days um, are running on Intel processors. Intel's a pretty big company, as most of you have probably heard of. Um, they are all what are called dual core processors. This is basically like having two processors on one chip. Um, so a lot of the kind of um, previous idea of a supercomputer was having all these multiple processors working at the same time. Well, at this point, they basically combine that into one chip that they can fit into something like a notebook or whatnot. Um, so that allows you a lot of ability to, uh, for the computer to be doing more than one thing at a time. Um, so like the operating system, as he was saying, is always running in the background, taking up a certain amount of the, the computing power of your processor. Um, and then if you're working in Word or surfing the internet, checking your email, whatever you do on your computer, um, each of those programs that you have open is taking up more of your computing power. And so this allows it, the computer to keep running a lot better while you're doing multiple things at the same time. So your computer's not going to kind of bog down if you're surfing the web, checking your email, and in the background, you're playing some music or something like that. So, you know, one thing is, when we talk about computers, it's almost like we have a different language, right? <laughs> so, we say dual core, and you might be wondering, well, you know, what's dual core? What does that mean, right? In the past, the processor, just kind of like the brain of the computer, runs at a certain speed, right? And over the years, they're getting faster and faster and faster. But the problem is, at this point, they're getting so fast, that there's not much more they can do. They can't make the brain much faster. So what they're doing is they're putting two brains on one chip. So that's what we mean by dual core. When we say dual core, it's actually a lot easier than it sounds, right? Just two brains on a single chip. And so since that's the trend nowadays, as Gabe was saying, um, you can do a lot of multitasking, right? In the past, you can maybe be doing one thing at a time on your computer, right? Nowadays, you can be doing you know, internet, email, work, and you know, with very little slowdown, you're still running at a very high performance. And even if you don't do all those things at the same time, this is just if you're, if you're looking at a machine and somebody's trying to sell you on something that, that isn't dual core at this point, they're probably trying to sell you something that's kind of old, kind of outdated. Um, so for the most part, that's, that's what you're going to see. That's kind of the buzzword that you're going to hear about processors right now is dual core or multi-core, things like that. Um, so that's the main one. Did you have a question, sir? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Let me bring the dual core down to a, a level of language that I understand. Sure, please. You talk about one brain versus two brains, and that's kind of like... Uh, when I'm in the kitchen, uh, because I'm the, I'm the chief cook and bottle washer now that I'm retired, and when my wife comes in there, see, first there was just one brain, and now there's two brains, but they still don't work together. <laughs> so how does it do it? <laughs> Thankfully with a computer, it's a, it's a little more cooperative than that. They can, they can uh, share their, their, um, kind of their processing power to focus on one task, um, but they can also go in separate directions. So the one, both of you could be washing the dishes at the same time, one person washing, one drying, or one person could be cooking dinner and one person could be washing dishes. Um, so it really gives you more flexibility in that. In good that good bus means, means good communications between the two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they communicate nicely. Another uh, measure uh, how good your computer is, is your memory. And it can be kind of confusing because there's different kinds of memory. The memory that we're talking about is RAM. That's R-A-M. It stands for Random Access Memory, but you don't need to know that. <laughs> Basically, the memory is like the working memory. It's what you can be working on at one time. So if you have a little bit of RAM, a little bit of memory, you can maybe be working on one thing at a time, uh, you know, somewhat slowly. Uh, and we'll show you some examples of that, but if you have a lot of RAM, uh, you have a lot of working memory. It's like your brain can hold more things at once. So that's really the best explanation of RAM that I can give. If, I, if I can jump in for a second, um, I'll give you the other half of that, and then I've got to really tie it back to that cooking metaphor, an excellent way to put this. Um, the other type of memory that people talk about is their hard drive. 
Um, it's where like everything is stored on the computer, all your files, all your documents. It's, it's the, the big storehouse, your library of everything. Um, so to, to bring this back to that, that kitchen example, your RAM is like yeah. storing that's a recipe for the dish you're cooking in your head. You, can, you keep working on it, you move through the steps so you know how to do it quickly. You don't have to keep going back to that cookbook, which is like your hard drive. Um, and that cookbook has got all sorts of recipes that you're probably not using right now, but you've got it open to the one. But every time that you have to go walk back over to it, it's going to take you longer to get to it. So if you have more of the RAM, more of the kind of active memory in your computer, um, then you're going to be able to move uh, much more quickly through whatever you're working on on the computer. It's not going to kind of slow down because he keeps having to go back to that hard drive, to that cookbook to, yeah, to check it out. So just to reiterate, the two types of memory. RAM is your memory. Can you remember that recipe as you're working on it? And hard drive is your store book, right? your archive, all the information that you save but you don't necessarily need right now. Uh, two other things you might want to look for in a computer. If you are just going to be doing internet browsing or email uh, or word processing, the basic stuff, you don't need what's called a graphics card. Sometimes they call it video RAM, but generally we call it a graphics card. What a graphics card is, it's dedicated memory that's just for graphics. In other words, just for video, just for pictures, for stuff like that. So unless you're doing uh, this high level stuff, right? Video editing and uh, you know some of the other kids like games, for example, that requires a graphics card. If you're buying a computer for yourself and you're only going to be doing email and stuff like that, you don't need to worry about the graphics card. What if you're using iPhoto? Do you need a graphics card now? Uh, no, iPhoto actually runs fairly well without the graphics card. So I use it without one on the laptop. Sort of the uh, the distinction as far as as what qualifies as the graphics that the graphics card works with. Um, it's sort of 2D versus 3D. Anything like photos, pictures, um, anything that you just kind of see normally on the screen, like a internet window, that's all 2D graphics. It's like flat, like a piece of paper. Um, and that's not really going to do anything on your graphics card. It's the more 3D graphics and special effects. So like a game that's creating this, this 3D world for you, or um, if you were creating um, 3D animations, um, like you see like uh, the Pixar movies, that sort of thing. Um, or if you were going We're to be doing watching YouTube and stuff like no, that. No, that, that that's all. Sense. That's playing. Playing video doesn't require that. Okay. Playing video, you don't need a powerful graphics card. Okay. Um, just creating video that you would. Now there is one exception. If you're going to be doing basic video editing, you don't need to worry about the graphics card. But if any of you get really into it as a hobbyist and you pick up a piece of software like Final Cut Express or Final Cut Pro, once you start upgrading and doing high level video, it's a very good idea to have the graphics card. Because whenever you do special effects, or when you apply filters or things to modify the image, you'll see that it's a lot faster with the graphics card than without it. So that's one notable example. How about uh, uh, AutoCAD or something of that sort? That is very, very much something you want for a graphics card for. That's, that's the type of 3D creation that you'll want that for. Yeah. Um, anything that's, that's sort of doing that 3D in, in real time, that's not kind of sitting there processing it, but doing it right in front of you, that's that's where that really comes in handy. Does Google Earth use uh, video cards? Yes, it would It would take advantage of that, for sure. And we were actually going to gonna talk about Google Earth a little later, too, and show you that. So. Photoshop? Photoshop is more the 2D. It doesn't require the graphics card so much, definitely. Although it always helps. <laughs> it, it may not be necessary, but no matter what, we'll always help. Right. If, if you're on a budget, it's one of those things that it's good to figure out whether you feel like you really need it or not. Um, but if you are not as concerned about the price of the machine, having it is never going to hurt you. Um, How much does it cost? How much does it run? I, well, it's one of those things that it, you can upgrade it to your heart's content. You can get the really, really crazy high-end one, and it's going to cost you sev several hundred dollars more. Or you could get just a, a basic one that's going to be better than not having one. And um, it'll it'll just be a minor addition, upgrade to computer, hundred bucks, fifty bucks, something like that. Mm -hmm. Generally, you can't really install them afterwards, though. It's mm -hmm. something that you have to buy um, as a part of the notebook to begin with. Um, but it, you're, the 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 tricky part is that they're not named very clearly. They all have their kind of brand names. You'll see things like GeForce or um, the ATI or NVIDIA, things like that. Um, the, and then they'll have some numbers after them, like a 5600 or an 8600 or something like that. Um, and generally they get more powerful as those numbers get bigger. But, uh, but it's, not, it's not a clear-cut thing, it's, it's something that you 
Um, if you are concerned with it, it's probably worth putting in a little research, or if you come into us, and hopefully you will, um, we try to kind of clear that up for you as much as possible, so you don't have to go hunt your specs. just do a video in the background. Uh, that's something that pretty much, if you can run the software, mm -hmm. if you can run the program that does the video editing, uh, that'll be fine. You won't have to worry about it. But you need an iPod or something to... Oh, no. Yeah. Any computer can do it. Would you repeat that question, please? Uh, the question was if you wanted to add music. If you're doing video editing of a home movie or you know, an event, for example, and you wanted to add music to the background, uh, you know, do you need anything special? Do you need any special hardware? The answer is no. Um, you actually can do that. I mean, as long as you can run the program, you won't have any problems with it. For example, at the moment, we are taping this event on that camera, and it's got a built-in microphone, so that would come in sort of as one um, video with its own audio. But we also have a much better mic set up in the middle of the table here. Um, so we'll be actually taking this into a, a video editing program like Final Cut or uh, Adobe Premiere on the Windows side is a good program, um, and, and basically lining the two of those up. And that's not something that's partic particularly difficult to do. As, as he said, if you can run the software to begin with, it, it really is pretty, pretty easy. things that you tend to see. Um, any computer you buy these days, any notebook computer at least, not necessarily a desktop, um, should have a wireless card built in, a wireless internet card. Um, so that if you're, say, on campus here where there's a wireless network over a lot of the campus called Air Bears, um, you would have internet access without having to hook up any, any wires, any telephone cables, ethernet cables, anything of that sort. Um, you can also set these up at home um, with uh, the right equipment, which are they're pretty easy to set up these days too. Um, but that's something that you want to also look for in a, in a new machine, is, is does it have a, a wireless card installed in it? Um, another, you'll, another kind of wireless technology that you'll he hear people talk about is called Bluetooth. Um, a lot of computers ch tend to come pre-installed with that from the factory these days. Um, but at the same time, a lot of other things like cell phones have Bluetooth. That's where you tend to hear people talking about Bluetooth a lot. Um, you hear about like Bluetooth headsets, the little like pieces people have in their ears that makes them look like they're talking to themselves all the time. <laughs> um, and basically it's just kind of same idea as with the wireless internet, except it's meant for wirelessly connecting to little devices like your cell phone, or like a PDA, a little, little Palm Pilot, or like a wireless keyboard and mouse, that sort of thing. It's very short range, it doesn't extend over hundreds of feet, it's just right next to the two devices, um, but you don't need any, any cables to hook them up. Um, yeah, try Don't really have any good explanation for where the name came from. It's just the, uh, the the one they came up with. I'll tell you. Oh, go ahead. Harold Bluetooth was a Danish king many, many years ago. <laughs> and instead of cutting people's heads off, he tried to get everybody to cooperate, get ah. close together to cooperate. So that's basically good to know. Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> USB 2.0, as he said, um, is the current USB standard. USB, again, is the, just a little um, plug that looks about like this. It's a little rectangular plug, and any printer or keyboard, mouse, camera, pretty much any normal device that you want to plug into your computer at this point um, tends to use USB. Um, so USB 2.0, as I said, is the current specification for it. Um, older machines had USB 1.0 or 1.1. And the big difference there is that USB 2.0 is a lot faster. It's about 10 times faster. Um, and so for some things, it doesn't really matter, like with an older printer or a keyboard and mouse. It really doesn't matter what kind of USB port you plug it into. But if you hooked up like a digital camera or something of that, or like a little <laughs> webcam or a microphone, something of that sort that's transferring um, more data, or if you're using a flash drive um, where you want to or that's a good amount of data that you want to copy over to it, um, that, that difference in speed is going to be much more significant. Well, I guess uh, one last thing you might want to look for when you look for a computer is the optical drive. By optical drive, we mean what kind of disks does it write to? Like a CD, DVD, that sort of thing. Now, most, all of them, in fact, all of them will both play CDs for audio and sometimes for software, right? If you buy software, it comes on the CD. And DVDs, so movies, if you want to watch a movie on your computer, uh, and sometimes software comes on DVDs as well. Now, generally you have a choice between one that only burns CDs, so it can only write to CDs, 
and I want them to write both CDs and DVDs. So for example, if you want to make a mixed CD, right? If you want to use a program like iTunes, I will actually show you how to do this a little bit later, but say you want to make a greatest hits of your life, right? Your favorite songs from all your favorite records, you want to cherry pick the ones that you like and throw them all in one master CD, right? Yeah. To do that, all you need is a CD burner. And I think most, if not all the computers that we have, have CD burners nowadays, which is great. Now, say you are like this gentleman, you want to maybe edit home movies or events uh, using video editing software. In that case, you might want to write it to a DVD, right, and hand those out. So say you go to a wedding and film the wedding, right? You can burn 15 copies on a DVD and hand them out, you know, to friends and family. It's, it's great for Christmas presents and stuff like that, too. And then they can take that home, put that in their home DVD player on their TV, or put that into their computer, and then they would be able to watch that, too. So even people who aren't computer savvy, like you will be, <clears throat> will be able to take these DVDs, just pop them in, you know, sit down on the couch and enjoy it. So it's very cool. Questions? What about burning uh, an LP? I've got a lot of LPs from <laughs> yesterday uh, onto a CD. That, that's a hairy uh, subject. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's a little tricky. Unfortunately, because you're taking a what's called an analog uh, medium um, and converting that to a digital format, it actually has to undergo that conversion process. Um, taking music off a CD, which is already a digital format, is very easy. Um, but to do it from an LP, um, you would need basically a little analog to digital converter, something to take that, that sound in and convert that for you. Now, it can be done, and it's not very difficult, it's just time consuming. Right. Aren't there actually pieces of equipment now where you can take your old LPs, put it on that, they plug into your computer and it does it automatically? There, there are some. Um, they're they're not flawless and they're they're kind of specialized, they're hard to find, but they do exist, yes. And, and they're also costly, which is a good downside. I mean, really, the difference between bringing uh, CD audio is that with CD audio, you don't have to do it in real time, right? The CD can have an hour of music, and you can bring that in within four or five minutes, right? Unfortunately, with the LP, unless you have very specialized equipment, you got to sit through the whole LP just to bring it. You got to play the whole, play through the whole thing and basically re-record it on the computer. So, yeah. so if you do one of these with the music in the background, so forth, does the person that you give this uh, DVD to have to have special equipment to, nope. to hear any of it? No, no, not at all. You uh, basically, you would, if your computer has that DVD burner, um, you would just take the the project that you you edited on your computer, burn that onto the DVD, and then that DVD will be readable in anybody else's DVD player. It's like no, you're, you're no special producer, right? So you're sitting in the producer's chair, uh, you're making a final product, and when you're done, your vision will go on the DVD, and they'll pop it in just like they got a, a store bought DVD. It's like they went to Best Buy and, and bought it from the shelf, right? I mean, it's it's your project, so it's it's nothing special. It's actually very cool. Is it HD that's coming out, but it has to, it, not everybody can use it. Yeah, we can spend a minute on them. There are two formats, it's HD DVD um, and Blu-ray, uh, which are basically two different names for a very similar type of technology. They're both for this high definition video, that's what HD is, high definition. Um, and basically, it's the idea of a normal DVD only will display things so clearly, so crisply, because it can only fit so much information on that single disc. Um, an HD DVD um, holds a lot more information, so they can make it look a lot clearer, a lot sharper, um, that sort of thing. And these two formats, this HD, DVD, and Blu-ray, um, are basically different way, different, two different companies came up with different ways of writing that information on the disc. Um, so it's, it's sort of like the difference between, um, this may make sense to some of you, and it's not so much sense to others, um, when DVDs first came out, um, started kind of taking over from VHS, um, there were DVD minus R and DVD plus R, or even further back when VHS was new, there was VHS and Betamax. Um, there were two different formats there. And so it's the same thing here. Every, every time they come up with a new format, they create two different standards for it, and everybody has to fight it out for which one they're going to use. Um, and it's, it's pretty early to decide which way is going to win on that one. I think because you order, we can order a lot of these things online now, and so you need to be careful if it says HD or right, you know. right. I mean, a lot of a lot of computers, a lot of uh, players right now, they won't read those That's HD right. discs. So uh, right now, DVD is still the standard. What's the difference between R and RW CDs when you go to buy? Them? RW is rewritable. R is just writable. You can write it once and you're done. Rewritable, you can write it and then erase it and write it again and erase it and write it again. It's over and over again.
hard drives are magnetic. Um, they are more stable than a portable magnetic device, like a zip drive or a floppy drive. Um, they are not as stable as a flash drive, but if you needed to back up that much data, that would probably be the way to go. Do they make flash drives in large capacity? Not in that capacity. They do go up into many gigabytes now. I mean, you can find even just the little thumb-sized ones go up to uh, 16 gigabytes. Um, so very, very large there. And they are starting to actually create what are called solid-state hard drives, which are basically hard drives made out of this flash memory. Are they? Um, they are. They're, they're <laughs> the <laughs> kind of leading edge of things. You're it looks just, like that's going to be the future. Definitely. Yeah, you, definitely. You're that's just starting to see it show up in notebooks for now. For. Um, they're, yeah. they're literally yeah. brand new. Photographs and movies. And stuff. Well, yeah. Yeah, if I could just chime in, backup is obviously it's one of the biggest problems that is you know, existing in computers today because a lot of things have been solved, but backup is one of those things where you have to be conscious about it. Right? The computer won't take care of it for you. So if you have a terabyte of you know pictures or movies of personal data that you, know, you can't replace, really the only way to be safe is to be redundant. In other words, to have more than one copy. And so there's systems well, that you can see. What's that? You know, one point five terabytes of data. Yeah, is, 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 it's different. Uh, yeah. Well, would you you, you have to probably pick up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely not going to go on a flash drive. And as far as those solid state drives go, they're going to be you know far too expensive in the near future you know to make that feasible. So really, the best one is to set up a system where you have multiple hard drives and they're doing what's called mirroring. So when you write to one hard drive, it writes a backup, you know, completely redundant copy of the same yeah, file. Yeah, I have that on the master drive in the computer, but, you know. Right, I mean, what, what, a lot of, what a lot of companies do is they'll, they'll basically diversify their types of backups. They'll do exactly that with multiple hard drives. Um, they would also then write kind of incremental changes to DVDs or something of that yeah. sort. And they might have some other company off-site um, do write it to um, magnetic tape or something of that right. sort. So you've got several different copies in several different places yeah. so that if something does happen. And of course, if anybody's worried about backup and you'd like to come talk to us, we're always going to be here at the Scholar's Workstation. So if you want to set up a system or if you need help or advice, uh, come by and we'll be Right, I mean, that sort of situation is, is kind of the extreme end of thing. Most people just backing up the hard drive on their, their computer would be perfectly well set with an external hard drive or a few DVDs. Flash memory, um, like these little flash drives or thumb drives, jump drives, people call them all sorts of different things, um, are even more durable than CDs or DVDs at this point because they can't be scratched or things of that sort. They don't really degrade over time. <laughs> yeah, they're just little 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 pieces that plug right into the computer. Um, they kind of, they're, they more than anything are probably the biggest reason that floppy drives, zip drives, and all those other kind of little disk technologies have, have really fallen off is because these things require no drive of their own. There's nothing special you have to have on the machine, just a, any machine with USB ports, which is a very, very common connector. Um, you plug it right in and copy your data to it. It works exactly like a, any other kind of disk. It just appears on your computer. You drag and drop files to it. Um, and what's really great about them is that they don't require any um, any source of power to store that data. They don't, like they, you don't need a, in, any internal battery, it, and it's not magnetic. So like a, a floppy drive or a zip drive, if you leave that thing sitting there, the kind of magnetic data on it wears out over time. It gets the files get corrupted. Um, the data disappears over time. These are, are what's called non-volatile. They don't they don't uh, degrade over time anyway. So um, you can leave that sitting there for a very very long time, years and years, and it will be exactly like you left it the next time you plug it in. What did you call it? Um, it's called a flash drive. They're very cheap. Yeah. They're, They're very cheap, cheap definitely. What about but brand names on those? Uh, you see them from Letzar, Sandisk. Which are they basically the same? I mean, um, they are largely the same. I mean. Uh, picking a, a more recognizable name like uh, SanDisk or iOmega, uh, who made all the zip drives back in the day, um, tends to be not, a, it, it's not going to hurt you, but really they're all pretty good. I mean, some are, more than the quality of the, the chip itself is more the, the durability of the casing and the design, that sort of thing. Two questions on that. Mm -hmm. First of all, technical differentiation between a flash drive and an SD card. Mm -hmm. and, and then and secondly, uh, those are all uh, writable and erasable too. Yes, they? they're they're completely rewritable. You never, you, it's not like a CD where you write to it <clears> once. They they can be um, altered over and over again. And some of them um, say they're high speed. What's that? 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> let me get to your, your first question about the, uh, the SD card or any other kind of flash card versus a flash drive. Um, a flash card, like what you would find in a digital camera or some cell phones, things of that sort, um, is basically just a little chip, exactly like what's inside of a flash drive. Um, it, the flash drive is basically a self-contained device, whereas a, a flash card, like an SD card or an XD card or a memory card, things of that sort, um, those need a special drive to read them. Um, and as for uh, the kind of branding and marketing and things you see that say high speed, um, some of them do advertise as being faster, and the differences are not gigantic for the most part. Um, they, they can be made marginally faster by just using slightly higher um, speed types of memory inside of the, the device itself. Um, but the, the connection that they're using for the computer is the same. Um, the overall um, quality of the, of the data of the copy is going to be very similar. And the speed difference, unless you're moving a lot of files all the time, is probably not going to be the biggest concern. <laughs>
What's what's our address here? Do you know? Uh, let's go with our old address in University Avenue, which is twenty two hundred University 2, Avenue. Twenty two hundred University. I don't know if it'll actually find our address on campus perfectly. So I discovered there's a version of this called uh, with the Mappy. Uh, you, I, I haven't actually seen that one, no. And, it, uh, and, the, and the data showed on my computer sharper uh, hmm. than it did uh, through the uh, um, Google Earth interface. Just particularly on the edges. Hmm. Yeah, it really it so, depends uh, on where you're looking because sometimes the resolution is higher than others. Uh, well, that I know, but I mean, that would also be because they're actually feeding off the same database. Interesting. Um, no, I haven't seen it. It's all from Keyhole and then all from the, and from the sat satellite, one particular satellite. Gotcha. Isn't it true with Google that you can get a higher resolution image if you pay them to join their um, There are services that let you get higher resolution data from them, yes. Um, if you had reason to want it, yes. Yeah, to pay for it. They actually even uh, supply the services to some of the news companies. If you watch some of the news channels, you'll see that they use Google Earth for mm -hmm. the stories. Yeah. And it's obviously better images than you can get yeah. on the PC. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there was a, a sign-up. I was wondering whether you knew what the difference was. No, I don't particularly. But, uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's lots of alternatives to Google Earth. This is the one we're going with because it's the most common and it's the most proven. And it's Mac and PC, so it's, it's platform uh, cross-compatible. Right? But as you've seen, uh, we can find businesses, we can get directions, we can just zoom around. I mean, you can go to you know, all the cities of you know, your imagination, right? If you want to see uh, the Dome of the Rock, if you want to see Rome, or if you want to see you know, anything really, you can zoom in on street level, you know, see what's going on, get a lot of data. So it's a very, uh, very cool program. Now, one funny thing that you might find interesting is a lot of governments are uncomfortable with Google Earth. Oh, I bet. Because their sensitive oh, yeah. military yeah. sites are not visible to anyone. China, yeah. Yeah. Especially China. So uh, there's actually been some uh, interesting developments. There's some, some governments have come to Google and demanded wow. that they lower the resolution of the images so they can't do any military reconnaissance. Well, our, our government, too, did yeah. these houses blurred out. So there, there are actually uh, many places that are sensitive where if you zoom in, you won't get quite the same level of detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you will in Berkeley, which is cool. But you can have purple line, the directions. That's, that's, good. that's how we get uh, from our old location to the Viceroy yeah. restaurant. Yep. Now, say we wanted to go from, uh, from New York, New York. Okay. You, you <laughs> so could still get those directions. If you wanted to cross country road trip, you would still oh, get it. Oh, that's a long way to go for yeah. Indian food. <laughs> 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 for Indian food? Yeah. Yeah, quite a long way. But, yeah, so it's, it's a very. And we can actually, uh, we can make the trip if you'd like. Oh, it'll, it'll actually run the whole route for you. Oh, so you can see what you can't see. Turn right. Yeah. So again, very. Yeah. Would you have a uh, uh, um, directional um, um, listing for uh, getting from one place to the other? Driving like left, right, and that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, it certainly or, gives you those directions in the yeah. section here. Is it under route? Is it under route? Yeah, it's at, right where my this cursor is. Yeah, oh, okay. Turn right at Hudson Street. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'll you to Pompeii. Will it take you across the water? Or by yeah. yeah, it tells you to swim. It tells you to swim. Does it really? 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 He wants us to swim the English Channel. So it's a very, very versatile program. And I mean, I can show you tons of this stuff, but I think you got the general idea here. Now this is an interesting development because in the past if you wanted to run software you had to download it, save it on your computer, and you have to run it from your computer, right? But now because we have broadband, because we have very fast connections to the internet, right? The program can stay on the internet and you can run it without even downloading it, right? That's the idea of a web application. So if anyone's used Hotmail, or uh, even the CalMail application, if anyone has a CalMail address. Um, those are examples of web applications, right? People think of them as websites, but interestingly, you know, they're really programs that you run in your browser. So Google is taking this kind of to the next level here. Um, now, unfortunately, I don't really have an account, do you? Um, I have a, an account for some of them, yeah. Okay, why don't we go ahead and let Gabe uh, <laughs> take a seat here. The idea behind uh, Google Documents is that you have a suite of office tools, similar to Microsoft Office. You have a spreadsheet, you have a presentation tool, 
you have a calendar, you have a word processor, you have all the tools you normally need to use, only they're available for free <coughs> through your browser, and they actually need to be storage too. So if you want to conceptualize this, right? You can sit at any computer, log into this website, and it's like having a little terminal here, right? And you get from Windows, like every program from Windows. But what I can do up here is go to New. Uh, I can choose a new document spreadsheet or folder. Right? So for example, I'll make a new document here. I have tools very similar to what I have in Microsoft Word. Right? I can begin typing. <laughs> if I can get a hold of everything. This is a surprisingly bad angle to type at. It's like <laughs> typing like this is not so easy. So it's, it's almost exactly like uh, Mm -hmm. you know, regular word processor, mm -hmm. right? You know, you know the shortcuts, right? So mm -hmm. if you know the shortcuts, they work exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, does it have page view? Does it have page view? I'm sure it does. Being a WYSIWYG view of what the page looks like. Uh, I don't know where it is off the top of my head either. Print view, it would be like print view. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I believe it does. Uh, and unfortunately, neither of us work with their... Act we, we don't yeah, actually use it because we like have it via... Yeah, you can probably put the preview up there. Oh, yeah. Uh, to your left. To your left. Ah, And you can access Google Map this way? Uh, you can access Google Maps this way. You can access all of Google's site, all, all of Google's tools from just google.com. Right. And does it, does it require the same uh, uh, capabilities of your computer as it downloading? No, pretty much any, any computer that's going to get you on the internet uh -huh. is going to be able to, to work with the online versions of their tools. So what's the difference between Google Earth and Google Maps? Google Earth has a lot of their um, kind of features integrated. It, it has a lot of the same features as Google Maps as far as directions go and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it gives you a much more interactive interface as far as being able to move around places, uh, kind of spin that globe around, zoom in any, anywhere you want, um, see all those kind of site markers and the pictures people have added, things of that sort. Mm -hmm. You save your files with the site? Um, what? Sorry, we had some technical difficulties. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, you can save okay. to, to Google's website. What you do is you create an account with Google, and they give you an email account, they give you the ability to use the documents, the groups and things. One of the real nice things that I like about Google Documents is the collaborative um, working sense of, of, of documents. So I can, you could can be working with three or four other people on a newsletter, put it all up in Google Documents, and everybody can access that document. You Basically, you can set whether or not it's shared so that other people can see it. Not, everybody can't see all of your things, just what you allow them to. And is this a good archival site? Um, it is, it, um, because it's all stored on Google servers. You don't have to worry about any of the backup or anything of that sort. Um, it is possible that it could be lost or damaged and somehow, but in general, um, their servers are, are very reliable. And there's no security problems? Or, uh, Generally, I mean, Google is, is a pretty pretty trustworthy company as far as security goes. I mean, they're, they're working very hard at that sort of thing. Right. Um, and speaking of, of archiving and saving things, we even had some technical difficulties right there, and it, it saved yeah. what he'd been typing. That's, as, that's all right thing about Google, yeah. It's, uh, it'll automatically save for you. Uh, and you can revert to previous states, right? So if you're not used to having it automatically saved, you can always go back to what it was before it automatically saved. But you see, uh, you know, right here, this is basically our file system, right? So on your computer, you normally save documents into a folder or My Documents or something like that. And this is basically My Documents, Google style. Right? Mm -hmm. You can add spreadsheets, you know, any kind of documents that Google will, will uh, open here. Keep them all in this window, organize them into folders. It's exactly like having it on the desktop. Um, you delete stuff. You know, move around, upload it. Can what? you add to that archive files that you created? I'm just about to say that. So, yeah, so let's, let's give an example of this here, right? I have Microsoft Word on my dock, right? So this is a program that I have uh, running sorry. locally. I bet you that won't run because it's the demo version. Okay, <laughs> I stand corrected. I am going to open a text program. So here's a program for typing. I, I can create a document. I'm going to save it as test, okay. I'm saving on my desktop. So this is just a regular document that I've created uh, on a regular program that I'm running on my computer, right? I'm actually gonna save it as Word format, just so you can see what it is. So this is the same as a Microsoft Word document. Now, see this button here that says Upload? I click on Upload. 
I click choose file, because I have to choose the file I want to upload. I remember that I saved it on my desktop. Here it is, test mm -hmm. document, right? And it says Microsoft Word document, that's the kind of file it is. Now what do you want to call it? I'm going to call it test document. Makes sense, right? <laughs> now I'm going to hit upload file. It will take just a second here. And here it is. It's basically showing you what was in that document right now. And it stays there until I destroy it. Exactly. Correct. Um, and what's really great is that not only can you upload files like that, if somebody emails you a Word file or an Excel file, it can open it right out of your, your email. Um, yeah. So if you have like a, a Google email account, a Gmail account, um, if like a lot of my staff, I send out our staff schedules in Excel. Um, they just open it up in Gmail, click on it, and it pops it right up in their browser. They don't have to open Excel. They don't even have to have Excel. And they can look at it, work with it, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So very cool. We have everything stored here. It's exactly like on your desktop. And it's free. So oh, it's, it's free? It's entirely free. Cost. Yeah, no, no charge for any of it. What um, you do have to register with the You do have to sign up for it, but there's there's no there's no catch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is there a, a limit as to how much can be saved? And I believe it's stuff? two and a half gigabytes right now. Oh, and it's okay. constantly and it's increasing. And you could mine that? Um, yeah. You, you can, but uh, I mean, it, the, the vast, vast majority of people will no, never fill no, it up. And as I said, they, they have a little counter on their website that's constantly in, ticking up saying this is how much space you have. It just keeps going, going, going up. Pictures or something. Yeah. If you're just talking about documents, it'd be pretty hard I'm, to fill <laughs> Store the Library of Congress I'm on that. Yeah, no, you can uh, you can certainly manage to fill it up eventually with photographs. But well, and they've actually even got a photo uh, they do. program. That's See right here, there's one that says photos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Do they start sending you spam email after you join? No, they don't. Mm -hmm. Google's actually very good about that. Uh, that would be fast, pretty much, too. Yeah, exactly. Google, uh, they basically make their money through advertisements. So the only place you'll see advertisements is if you're using their, uh, uh, their email service. While you're searching your email, there'll be a banner ad at the top. And you know, the companies pay them to put those ads. But other than that, uh, I mean, there's no charge to you. It's completely free. There's no charge to you. They're not selling your information. They're not sending you all sorts of things. It's, it's, um, really it's just only the ads that you would see on on the page while you're browsing the internet through their their site. That's that's where they make all of their money, basically. And as we said, the map functionality that we showed you, all those directions and finding uh, restaurants and stuff like that, that's all built into here. So it's a really integrated system. <coughs> you can do it from any computer, you know, home or work. And so it's, it's really good for, for working on multiple computers. We got about five minutes. Uh, how do you guys feel about doing some photography? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Yes. Oh man, I'll, we should probably stay a little late if we can. You know, if we can. Uh, we can probably push it a few minutes. Okay. So I have with me a digital camera here. Uh, with Gabe's permission, I'm going to have a picture of him. So. Okay. Uh, here, keep going. Sit somewhere. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and are you guys okay if I take off the picture of all you guys? Oh, sure. So I reach these. Okay. So now I have a few pictures on here. I have my cable here, my USB cable. I'm going to plug it in. Plug it right into his camera. And this program is what? Uh, you're going to see iPhoto in just a moment, oh, iPhoto. and it's going to pop right up automatically. He's not even going to do anything on the computer. So now, as soon as I plug in, iPhoto pops up. If you have a Mac, you have iPhone. iPhoto comes with every Mac. Uh, if you have a PC, I'd recommend a program from Google called Picasa. It's also you know, a very good program. Uh, it's called Picasa. So P I C A S A. Like Picasso, but with an A at the end. And it's a very good alternative to iPhoto. But if you have a Mac, like I said, you already have this program. So I plugged it in, the program popped up, and you'll see that it's similar to iTunes if everyone's ever used iTunes. On the left hand side we have the source menu. So this is the source of all the photos, uh, you know, whether it be the camera or your personal library or individual uh, film rolls that you've imported, right? Uh, so I've selected Canon PowerShot. It says it's ready to import three items because I took three pictures. All I have to do is click this button down here that says import. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. It's going to bring them in. No. And so now, if you look on the top left, I've selected the library. 
This is now the library of pictures that I have. Uh, it's not very impressive yet, but you can <laughs> understand that, you know, in, in a few years, like I have five, ten thousand pictures, right? And there's actually some cool things you can do. You can shrink them all, you can blow them all up, you know, so if you have thousands of pictures, you can get a simultaneous view, you know, and click on the one you want to see. Another cool thing is that it's sorted chronologically. So a few years down the line, once you have your library built up, you can scroll, you know, up to September 2006 and remember the good old days, uh, <laughs> you know, or even, you know, past there. If you're scanning pictures in it, if you have analog pictures you want to scan in, you can scan those in exactly the same, put them in your library, say what day they were taken, and you can archive all of your family photos, you know, everything, which is actually very cool. I have an analog, you mean from a camera? <laughs> he means physical, yeah. physical. Actual, actual, actual did you get them onto it? Uh, but the scanner, like uh, on our printer here, it's got a little flatbed right. scanner. Right. Out, so. Actually, uh, oh yeah, but does scanning harm the older photos? I the light, imagine the it, light. it might possibly. I don't think that's a major concern, but if you have a really delicate, like, extremely delicate They're antique pictures, photos or something of that sort, be careful with them, certainly. <laughs> and you might want to go to a professional agency that can you know, scan them for you at cost. Uh, that might be a better alternative if you're yeah, afraid of something like that. But generally, it's not a major concern because something you got from a photo lab is going to be fine. I heard something about scanners with cool light. Yeah, there. I mean, there are different types of scanners. What we were saying about um, if you if you have really delicate antique photos, something of that sort, it's probably best to get take it to somebody who can do it professionally because they'll have very very high tech equipment that can do it. Um, in extremely good quality without doing any harm to the original, that sort of thing. You sure it's not the sort of thing you usually invest yourself. Oh, the, you know, that thing on oh, the okay. Yeah. And that in fact, is so cool. Another thing you can do is, again, <laughs> like, you have a built-in uh, webcam. It's actually on the lid here. You see how I'm pointing to it right here? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, my. So, let's see. I'll go ahead and I'll pick a better effect here. I'm just gonna go That's a lot of built-in in effects. <laughs> so, I'll take a picture of all of the Macintoshes have that? All the new Macs have all the new notebooks, yeah. And the oh, high school. Like so that's me, and actually, a really neat thing is I can just drag that picture. So here it is, right? Pick it up, drag it, and drop it into my library. Oh. Our customers love to play with the camera, by the way. <laughs> so here I am in the library now. And you can build the library using photos that you've taken from the webcam or any other source, right? Um, so here we are. Uh, oops. Okay. So here we are in our library. Uh, now what I want to do is actually edit these pictures because we have kind of low light here. This isn't an ideal condition for photography, but we can actually do some stuff to make it look better. So here's Gabe. I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> see, blow this up. Uh, we have a full screen menu right here. So this button, and you definitely want some of these buttons, but generally it's pretty intuitive, right? This button. And if you leave the mouse over it, it's going to tell you what it does. Yeah. So now we're on full screen mode. Here's Gabe. Look at me. Uh, you have controls here, right? So Green first screen. thing. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> this is an ARIA you're saying. Yeah, apparently. So this is my ode to TSW. Let's say, let's say you made your, your uh, video, and you, you're all done with your video, and now you want to design a DVD case for it, right? So if you're trying to design a DVD case, there's actually already uh, a setting right here. So it's 4x3 and in parentheses yeah. DVD. And you can, this is exactly the size of a DVD case. This is sideways, mm -hmm. right? But this would be the size you'd want to use. You crop. Right? So now we've cropped the picture somewhat. Uh, we have an enhancement button. If you don't want to fiddle, if you just want the computer to take care of the enhancement for you. It's basically balance all the colors, make it uh, the right amount of white and black and that sort of thing. It, it's like magic. In fact, it's a magic wand. Uh, <laughs> you click the magic wand and it looks a little bit better. A little bit crisper. Uh, you know, the levels you are a little bit better. the bright spot? This is all on the Picasso. Flash. This, is, this is iPhoto. Picasso does have a lot of the same yes, features. Yeah. Uh, so and Picasso is for... <laughs> for for <laughs> PC. So we also have retouching, you know, there's blemishes, yeah. you know, if you want to get rid of the beard, you can do that. <laughs> if, if, if I forgot to shave today. <laughs> so here, we'll, we'll even out that beard a little bit. But I don't want to get too in depth there. But uh, you get the idea. We have individual effects if you just want to apply, you know, black and white, for example. Or uh, if you want to fade the color, you can fade the color somewhat. Or boost the color. All right, there's a number of things you can do. Edge blur. Yeah, like the uh, matte and vignette effects. So kind of gives you a little head, mm -hmm. and a little, little two corners on it. That's what, thing. what about getting rid of that bright spot? That's it. That Actually, flash. The retouch might be a good choice, but now, I mean, keep in mind that I start outside of it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Keep in mind that iPhoto isn't going to do the work of a program like Photoshop, for example. Right? Photoshop. Uh, is a dedicated program for you know moderate to professional users uh, who are a little more proficient, and you know that will allow you to do anything you want, nearly anything you want. 
Right. Pull, pulling out a reflection like that is actually a very difficult thing. Removing like red eye from a flash is pretty easy, but getting rid of something like that is, is actually a lot harder than what you think. No, but for, for a beginner, right, if you just want to casually use uh, you know, digital photography, if you just want to organize your pictures, catalog them, do a little bit of retouching, there's no better choice than Picasso or iPhone. They're fantastic. Uh, and just the last thing I'll show you is the adjustment here. Right? If you want to actually get it and individually change you know, the different parameters like the contrast, the brightness, saturation, and so on, you can even uh, straighten pictures, right? If you took a crooked picture, oh. you can straighten it, right? Yeah, okay, that's very handy because it even gives you the grid so you can line it all up. Yeah, uh, uh, it has the sharpness and a number of other things you can do, but you know, you get the idea here, right? Now, we have a edited picture here, right? There's a number of things we can do with this. Um, iPhoto has some options that other programs don't. It has a, a system for designing books. If you want to design a gift book you know, for an event, if you want to do a birthday party and you want to give an after-the-fact present uh, to the birthday person, you can use pictures you've created and build a book. And when you're done, you order it from Apple and they send it to you bound, which is really nice. You just drop the pictures where you want to go. So here's the cover, right? There's you guys. Here's you know the first page. You want to drop some pictures in. Not here. Uh, whenever you see a grid, you can drop them in, right? And you know, we're running out of pictures, mm -hmm. but you can see how if you had photographed an mm -hmm. event, you could design a book mm -hmm. here. It's very neat. And they have all different types of books. They have hardcover, softcover, you can do calendars, you can do all sorts of other things with mm -hmm. them too. We if have our friend... holiday cards using that. Right? Yeah, exactly. If a friend sends photos and I want to include those photos in here, mm -hmm. and they they usually send it by email. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you, that's easy. If to... you get them, uh, if you're using um, Apple's mail program on a Mac, actually, uh, there's a way you can um, basically click on them and it'll send them right over to iPhoto directly. But um, otherwise, you can just save them and drag and drop. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, from any any program, any place in your computer, if you see an image and you want to save it, you can just drag it, right? So I pick up the TSW logo and drop it. And that works almost 90% of the time. I used to copy and, as, a, as a drag, but it works. When, uh, when you, you have to go to the desktop, the cord in oh, okay. the USB. I just copy it and it works for yeah. You have to tell the country to put yeah. it in <laughs> the iMac <laughs> or um, some other. I, you have other photo a programs yeah. in on your computer. <laughs> you have to tell us which one to put it in. Right. Yeah. My default for the Mac. It's uh, I think it's two S's in it. Yeah, I forget if it's one or two S's. And if you're and you running the Mac, I'll just stick with that. Yeah. Uh, and when you set up S, Passive, for example, it's either SSA or SA. I forget if it's one S or two. Uh, it'll ask <laughs> to become the Passive. Yeah. yeah. And that's for the PC. And then, you know, whatever you're putting in. Follow up to that particular question. It it's is. Picasa allows you to go and find every picture oh, on your hard drive. Right, it does have an automatic all scan. In one place it's true, although you can end up with a lot of stuff you don't want. That's true, because yeah, there's two images, images that you get from you. But yeah. you can move it around. And and Picasso, you work with Picasso? Yeah. Is it pretty close to this? Yeah. So the, the last thing I'll show you guys that I know everybody's really interested in uh, is Not the slideshow. Sure because, because you, know, you bring in pictures like, uh, and you want to either put them on a CD or maybe email a slideshow. I mean, there's a number of things you can do with a slideshow. Right? But with iPhoto and also Picasso, it's very easy. Right? In iPhoto, you just select the photos you want. Right? You see Dropbox over here. And you hit the slideshow button down here. Very bottom. So I click that slideshow button. It brings them all into the new view. And there's a couple things you can do. Yeah, we'll definitely add music. To this drama. Click the music button, and you have access to some pre selected music. Oh my God. But also, any music you have on iTunes. If you're using iTunes and you build a music collection, you can use any of that. So, mm -hmm. anything you've already brought in. Um, I'm just going to pick Lazy Day. How's that sound? <laughs> this might not be loud enough, unfortunately. So there's our song. Uh -huh. uh, Ken Burns effect. Do you guys know the documentary filmmaker Ken Burns? He does documentary on you know, yeah. World War II and jazz. He loves stuff. to pan around his yeah. photos. Uh -huh. They actually have the Ken Burns effect, which is uh -huh. zooming and panning on photos, uh -huh. right? Uh, you can do it automatically, which is what I'm going to do. Or if you have a, you know, a directorial spirit, you can actually get in there and make them pan exactly what you want, right? Um, now there's different transitions as well. Um, so I'm just going to choose random. So transitions between the different slides. And I'll hit play. Mm 
<laughs> and then you can see it on the screen. You can also save it and send it to other people as well. So. Nice picture, Andy. <laughs> how do you send it to people? You want to show how to? Sure. Yeah. So uh, let's see. There's a Sherman. Oops. There's a Sherman at the very top, mm -hmm. uh, and every Apple program has a Sherman. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, in this case, there are a few things we can do with the slideshow. We can email it, right? So what it'll do is take the slideshow, save it as a movie file, mm. and put it as an attachment on an email, right? Mm. So all you need to do is you know, type in the address of who you want to send it to, and off it goes, right? You can send it to Iowa, which is another program that every Mac comes with, if you want to put it on the internet, right? So if you uh, want to create a website of all your travels, which is what I've done, I can actually show you guys if you like, you can do that. The is that true for Snapfish? Is that is that considered one, or is that a very separate thing? Uh, what's it called? Snapfish. I haven't heard of that one, but um, there are, there are Extended actually Snapfish. plugins for iTunes, right. little little programs that other people have written that allow you to send it to Snapfish and other things um, like Flickr, those types of sites. Um, it's not built in though. Yeah. I mean, you have a lot you have a lot of leeway. If you want to go out and be adventurous and find these different services, you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it works well. And finally, there's the DVD. So this, I think this is the most popular option, right? If you have a very long slideshow mm -hmm. for a wedding or a birthday party or something, you throw music on it, you've done the Ken Burns effect, you've done all that stuff. You can put it on a DVD, uh, make a few copies, and hand them out as gifts. So that's actually it's very easy to do, um, very intuitive, and they're nice gifts.